Sometimes we have extra meetings at the Denver Public Library down at the office. About once a quarter on specialized topics like uh, app searching or the use of the office website and things like that. And uh, you know, they'll be announced way ahead of time. Uh, sometimes those are on Saturdays, sometimes they're on a weekday or a different time and day. So I like to mention that. Um, we have a drink for everybody. A lot of drinks, uh, and we just ask for a drink for our the cost. You know, we just spend money for that materials and website and you know, just to do stuff that we just really makes it different or anything. And so we're just here to help you do better with your idea, turn your idea into a business. Um, just a word of caution, anyone that has an idea and you're not currently tracking any, you should keep it confidential, uh, unless you've already disclosed it, of course. Uh, through the confidentiality arrangements, what you want to do is reserve your trade secret status. Uh, in the United States, you can publicly disclose your idea for a year before you can have to file, but of course, that's a little bit risky. Because other uh, people can see it, and if they need to the patent office, uh, then it's kind of a hassle of it to show that they got the information from the website. So, with that said, uh, any questions, of course, ask at any time. <laughs> uh, I'd apologize, my speaker canceled on me uh, last minute, so I've got some free things that we can talk about if you need anything else before you're interested in. Um, for our next uh, few meetings over the next couple of months, we have a big gas coming in two weeks, the 23rd of January. So he's good at logistics and you know managing large organizations. He's still just coming into one of the biggest uh, employers in Colorado, many tens of millions. So uh, he's a pretty down to earth guy. Uh, help you, you know, understand how uh, building a business. And then the uh, the second Monday, the 13th of February. We got Peter Adams coming from the Rockies Venture Club. He's going to be talking about uh, angel venture capital funding finance and uh, what investors are looking for in a company, how to structure yourself to do a bit of those things. 
And I've got an option here coming um, next year, 27th of the 4th. Monday, February, uh, Len Hyrick, he's an inventor, um, started a lot of companies and products. He's had some pretty good successes and a few failures, so he's a good guy to uh, give you some, some inside tips on how uh, things are going. So, with that, uh, usually we start, uh, make a round off, round and round, everyone take about a minute and just introduce yourself and what you've got going on in the inventor, entrepreneurship, startup world. And uh, we'll come back and decide what you want to talk about. It. So, I'll start with you, Roberto. So, I'm Roberto uh, Kuchkeva, I'm a presentation. I'm, uh, I just have to be in the department of my office and been practicing in the office of since 2003. Uh, I'm the U.S. correspondent of human capital firms, so I do an international patent, uh, um, uh, patent filing and prosecution of the patent application with the requirement of the U.S. prosecution. Okay, I'll ask you to get I am Bob Hurston, and I just had an idea that you started in the communication stages. Okay. Do you have a working program? I've got an idea for one, which I think can be pretty simple one, but uh, yeah. I'm just in the beginning stages. I have an idea that I've been going to Facebook work for about two years and haven't been able to do nothing about it. Okay. That's a good thing to probably. Uh, one of our search classes to get at least two research. I've done a lot of research on my own for not not really going to the library or nothing, but out in the public and then in the stores. Okay. There's nothing like it. But right. I find it. But yeah. I know I know I know they don't understand it. It's not bad enough to yet, but Yeah, but well, what you want to know is how close something is to it. Sure, yeah. true. Yeah. All right. And I'm oh, on what then. Okay. Uh, Eric. Yeah, I'm Eric here. I uh, just uh, relocated from Philadelphia to here uh, a few years ago. And I'm trying to sell a product online and sort of I, I need some help to do that. I'm also considering doing some import, import export, or particular import. And uh, also something I would like to get in touch with someone who has some experience. Right. Okay. Steve. Yes. Hi, I'm Steve. Uh, I've got a product that I just finished out on Kickstarter. It's called Big Squeeze. It's a ergonomic uh, tube squeezer. It's everything on metal and plastic tubes. And um, uh, so it's finished with Kickstarter. And um, some of you go going on and I'm getting uh, tooling done. Some of the tooling phase right now. Sorry, I'm the manufacturer. Uh, same goes to get that. Okay. 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 Uh, my name is Andre, and I have a company. I'm a student currently. Uh, I'm putting into action in real estate and fashion business. Um, I'm looking to learn about online business and video marketing. And uh, as far as inventions go, I'll keep them up first. Okay, Ed. Ed Wilson. I have four for the company back in 61. I have uh, eight patents, but they've all expired. <coughs> but I've come up with a new one that will enable me to get to markets that haven't been able to get reached before. So, <coughs> mainly the war of business. Okay, and Bach? Um, Bach, I, uh, I'm just kind of getting into this. I have a couple ideas that I think would be pretty good, and just want to learn how to get them out there. So. Okay, and I can oh, this is the Oh, okay. Perfect. I'm Herman. I have an idea for a game. I'm trying to launch that this year, so we'll do the manufacturing process. Uh, Dylan Dolati. Um, my background is in medicine, and I I don't have patent here, but I invented actually a shot a high section uh, through transfer department of C, but it didn't they didn't continue because it was a big project, so they couldn't fund it. Uh, I have that one, and I have uh, other non-medical 
ideas to pass in the future. All right. Uh, some of you may be wondering if I need my idea of how much can we say. So, uh, you, you give kind of a, a genetic top level function description, that's probably okay. So, it's just the thing is, you have to get in that detail on the particular way you're executing it. Um, so, talk about it in a very summary sense, you probably will then we can figure out the detail. Because <laughs> I know when things slip out, you know, it's a problem for us. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. I'm Jay Wilkinson, and uh, I'm just getting back into this again. And uh, I have a bunch of ideas where I'm going to run my head right now. I'm waiting for the, my employer to use the letter that says that I own what I need out. <laughs> so this is uh, an idea of having to work with someone. Yeah, I work for someone. Um, I work for both of them. Okay. Yeah. And they verbally have told me they're not interested. But at least he's not. I'm getting yeah. something in writing from them, from their lawyer. Yeah, that, that's a good point. If, you, uh, if you're inventing a field you work in, uh, be careful that the um, employer can make a claim to the invention. So the deal is. It depends on your relationship. Let's say you're an employee, you're using your resources, computers, to copy machines, whatever, equipment, mm -hmm. supplies, um, that gives them a right to claim. So, usually, we tell people if you're doing that, uh, they have this claim up front that you're working as an independent and they have no rights to it. Because it can be a sticky situation, and the same for our students or college students. So, let that clarify what you're trying to do. <laughs> no, I'm just going to take a while. 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 It's okay. I can try it for two years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Eric. Yeah, hi, my name is Eric. This is uh, my first time here. And I have a number of ideas that I probably most of us I have an app idea I have just for. Idea and uh, other inventions that I just want to sort of keep keep into my brain for uh, you know, take one step forward and the nice the first fight. Okay, Gary. Um, yeah, my name is Gary, and I've got uh, two products that I've got hands on, and um, I found some that uh, I'll be able to license them to. So we're trying to take it forward to figure out how to manufacture these things. Okay, so um, I got a presentation that shares on several things we can talk about that seems to be popular with the group. We can talk about uh, what it takes to get a patent, what patentability is. We can talk about trademarks. You know, I know what it takes to get a trademark. We can talk about, say, licensing agreements, what's in the licensing agreement, what to watch for. And I've got another one up here for. Uh, Inventor scams, you know, so they might be able to be ads <laughs> that take people's money and they uh, they say they're going to take care of everything and, and uh, make you a big success, but they end up just taking a lot of your money. <laughs> and they don't, the trouble is, they don't get the individual time and attention to your product and the launching or your teams. So, uh, maybe by a show of hands, uh, who would like to do hats? Um, or trade, we can do both, I guess. Trademarks. Okay. What's the difference of the two? Just for starters. Well, patent protects function of a product. Yeah. Uh, the professional gadget. Um, they can be done for business methods and software. Uh, we can do plants. You can do chemical compositions, pharmaceuticals. So it's basically anything that has a, a function that's uh, even made, that it can't occur in nature. And that's saying, well, that makes sense. Of course, the gadget is going to occur in nature. But sometimes pharmaceuticals, chemical compositions, if it's something, people are trying to pack something that happens in the forest, <laughs> you know, somehow. 
or something more close to that. Yeah, we design. Right, and design patents uh, are more artistic, kind of like a copyright where you get surface configurations, shapes, ornamentality, things like that. And you certainly can combine all these on the property. It's no prohibition. Yes. How long can you design a problem? If you get a problem, you can go to the design by the top. Can you still get design by the point prior to being launched? Yeah, what you uh, the easy way to do it is buy your design while your other one's still in. Then they can tie into each other. It's already got that. If it's already issued, you, you should have gotten it. Yeah. Can you get the design stuff and still in You can, uh, just as long as the utility patent isn't showing what you're putting in the design too much. Because that would be a fire art. You know your own stuff. So, um, a lot of times, maybe there isn't too much problem. The design patent is typically a little easier to get. It's kind of nice, icing up the thing. As you're saying, the utility patent hasn't issued yet, then it's still a lot of design. But you can tie them together. And then that way, your own prior work can't be used against you. That's the That's a good thing. So I got uh, some handouts. So again, please ask questions in front in case we do a good interaction. So on patents, there's four tests. Um, first one is a subject matter for a patent. And we've already touched on that a bit. It's basically anything that's being made that has a functional benefit. And so that, that can come in is the things like uh, software, methods, normal compositions, gadgets, web products, and then all that stuff. So, um, any questions on that? Yes. Um, when you take a, a product over someone's uh, data manufacturer, you should get a patent in that they have a price of home. Or, uh, yeah, they are on a country by country basis. So um, the way the, the laws work, they said you can file in one country, in one world, and within a year, you can secure all your patents that you want. And uh, the patent laws are a little different in the countries. You know, it looks like the patent countries, it's the money can add up on that. So I usually tell people you need to make sure that you have, let's say, a manufacturing and sales presence in that country and worthwhile to be there. Right. But I, uh, I read this in a book that if you, if you make a sale like in that country, you can't get a patent. Everywhere but the US. The US you got a year, you can make a sale. But uh, you know, say Europe and Asia, most of the other countries, there's a few exceptions. You have to have your tax file before you about three weeks ago. You call that absolute economy. And it's really the safest way to go. Yeah. yeah. When you file a patent in the United States and you want to file it internationally, you'd have to do them simultaneously. So that would be prior art, meaning you file first in the United States. Right, and so that first filing is priority in the world. Okay. That's the reason you do it within a year. Okay. If you don't do it within a year, then you lose that priority. Within a year, you file any other country. 
or many ministers. Yeah, any other ministry. Yeah. So there's um, the world has the same standards for the year, at last 20 years, worldwide. And uh, they're standardizing on a lot of other things to make it easier, but it's still a country by country patent issue. So we're lucky in the United States because you have a patent for this large population in the rest of the country as opposed to, say, a German patent. We just have a 50 million people. Here you have a 300 million people. And uh, like on your searching, you search US patents. Um, you're going to pick up a lot of foreign activity because anybody foreign is doing this and that they file the U.S. So you can pick that up. In fact, the U.S. Patent Office, um, they get about just under 700,000 applications a year, and over half are going to come outside the country. So you're actually picking up a majority of outside the U.S. activities. So I might make that. Uh, is anyone interested in software patents here? <laughs> Maybe <laughs> those uh, those are a little difficult on the statutory qualification. They have to perform a change of state, or you have to do something definitive as their end result. So you have software that generates a report. That's not good enough. It has to like calculate an index or cause of a definitive thing to happen. Uh, I did have a question or something about like like what if you were to um, try to get a patent on something that is kind of like a futuristic kind of idea that's not really invented. You would like like that's something weird. Like like a new technology that you have in mind that you were to create it like it would have to be completely different, is what you're saying. Yeah, the thing is, it has to, uh, it can't have like multiple applications. It has to be kind of a specific function. So usually, if it's tied into hardware somehow, it's easier. So it has to do something specifically at the end of it. So, you know, like financially, like if something calculates a credit score and then uh, loan approval is approved. Based on that index, that's fine because that's a that's a that's a definite But if it's a report that someone gets and then they look at it and decide what to do, then that's part of the decision process. So the software should be self-contained to make the decision, do everything without you know to possibly change um, a state of function. Uh, you can't apply for a patent before you have a working prototype. You can. It's, it's the risk you take, though. Because <laughs> if you don't have a prototype uh, and you have to make changes, then you're going to have to file continuations. Application. So I mean, it's a good recommendation to have a prototype. So at least you know what you're filing in the patent is real and works. But some inventions are hard to prototype. You know. It might be like a new a, a dam or a ship. You, you can't get it over those things. <laughs> so you can file it just based on the uh, engineering calculations. That's legal to do, but they better take some risk and that they may be wrong in places. And then you know you can't if you can't successfully commercialize it, then it's gonna be difficult to find that value. So if you can't prototype, I would say do it. Yes, ma'am. So um, how about the complex project? Like there is like different components. The project is small, like the shunt I've designed the uh, high technology shunt. I don't know if you're familiar with the shunt that you didn't pray to take out the, the fluid. And uh, this is for those people they they get problem with the shunt, it's plot and then they have to do Shunt revision and bunch of surgery, and it's not good for the patient. So I have designed this shunt which works based on the pressure inside the brain. So there is like electronic chickens, mm -hmm. and like there are different components. So how I should patent this 
while the, the project, the pro even building a prototype, it, it would need, uh, need a big budget, a big budget, like about a million dollars. Right. And if I talk to companies like Medtronic, they say, you should patent it first and talk to us. Yeah. So, <laughs> what do you think? Like in this case, what should I do? Well, in that case, I'll tell you a provisional. Just, just on that. everything you've got now uh -huh. and get that covered. And then go out and talk to your companies and then see if you can get some funding to you know, go to the next step and refine it. And then you can file your non provisional or we call it continuation applications. You should refine it that features or change features. It's better to have a, a disclosure that's kind of like half baked mm -hmm. and covered, and then you find it as you go with additional applications, as opposed to waiting till it's more like effective. So the provisional is for the whole project, for the whole fund? Or yeah, for there's, the it's really just a um, you file a disclosure, a complete description of what we know at that point, and it gives you half bank per year. Um, and it's basically, um, this is not a list of disclosures. So sometimes people that they'll file a provisional, and then they'll have more than a year may go by, and they may change a single file, but that's fine. It's just that you don't get the data unless you file it from here. So something to share, and that's something. Uh, when you mentioned kind of digging, that it involves multiple technologies, multiple uh, sub inventions, yes. right? Uh, especially when we belong to different fields of technology, then uh, if you also find one aspect, then the, the designer most likely is going to ask you to, 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 do a, to a, do a division of that, right? So, uh, so Sometimes it is very better by breaking down your know, big uh, invention of the different technology in multiple part of communication to the technology, right? To the very yeah. 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 Is it the patent office that attend to the split apart and the motivation of that? Because, you know, let's say you, you have an invention there and you've got three versions of it. But the versions are kind of a bit different. They can do that. They're motivated to do that. It's less work for them. And uh, that way you can uh, figure out commercializing it. You can say, well, version two. Is what's succeeding. So let's expand out and the other two. I'll just pull in a phase while we're in the skin. Because, you know, sometimes you do have different versions and we're going to see the markets and stuff like that. So that way you can kind of keep them all going for that period of time. You know, whatever it works. <laughs> so that, um, the subject matter filter, um, as long as it's human made and then not software, <laughs> it's not a big deal. Usually it's not. And so um, the second test, really, that just means it has to have a functional benefit, but that's also kind of good because it's, a, it's a, an idea or a product that you want to commercialize. So, of course, it's got to have a benefit to the general public. That's usually good too. So, the, the two real legal tests uh, are what we call novelty and non novelty. So, novelty is, is pretty straightforward. That when you file a patent application, the patent office will do their own search for uh, closed patents. And uh, they'll only reject you a novelty if they find something that will be happening. Pretty, the rest be pretty much exact. Now you can go on pretty safe there, but there is a catch. Um, most of theirs, they, they're focused on the field of use. Like, let's say I have a new pump, 
and I'm using it um, in a garden application. So the patent office, they'll search pumps in the medical field, the oil and gas field, and they search pumps in the aviation field. And you understand if they find a pump in one of those other areas that's got the features of your pump, they can use that information. So you always, even if you're searching, you always have to think outside of your field of use. Like, whatever technology you've got, wherever else that can be used, you want to search it, because that's the kind of thing to search for for you. So it depends on the product. Some have a lot of different views of that So that's the main catch on novelty now. Obviousness, when I might say on novelty, it's they have to find a single reference to make it a so like it just be another patent now. It does it's not limited to the United States, we can learn the world. So that's a little tricky too. They can reject you against a Russian patent, a Japanese patent. <coughs> and the patent office is they're not entirely fair because they'll reject you say it's a Russian patent. Uh, all the patents online, the, the abstracts are summary to English, you've got the figures which are Understood in any language, but the text that we in the language. So the patent office, they will reject you and say it's a Russian patent. They don't translate the text. You have to do that. Plus, the other really says, and that's a burden because that may be five hundred to fifteen hundred dollars to get that translated to see what it says. So that's a gotcha. <laughs> Now, obviousness is just it's a step beyond novelty. In other words, if the limitation of a single reference is removed, they can reject you, say, against four references that each have a bit and a piece of the invention. So, the way you get a proof for a patent is let's say my invention has three parts to it. They can't find a novelty a single reference of those three parts. In obviousness, they only find two patents and two of the parts. They can't find one of the parts. Then you're in pretty good shape. As long as that third part is not something that saves or the next field of art or whatever normal technician would be known to do. But that's something you can argue against. So, Questions, right? Well, in that scenario of obviousness, novelty, what have you, do they also segment between industrial, commercial, and no, no, it's all one together. It doesn't matter what happens. As long as that technology is there, it can be made to fit like a pump. It can be from medical, commercial, industrial, aviation, um, oil, whatever. As long as it, the core features of it. Match. So sometimes people get a surprise there because they think it's only for one use. But what what happens a lot of times? People invent something and they might find a new use for the new vision first, and that would be pretty important because it adds potential to it commercially. So you always kind of want to be thinking real broad base, like invent something to for a particular kind of segment. There could be other market areas that we could find a use in. It could be very beneficial. This happens all the time. Because you just don't know until you start working with it. So, uh, any other questions in offices? Yeah. One last one, I'm sorry to set up the um, You said there's a church on the uh, library downtown and we could do our own research. Yeah, there's uh, you can do online anywhere for the library. Uh, three basic ones. We have class in which you can use the USPTO.gov. You can use um, eSpace.net, which is the European Patent Office. You can use Google. So here you can search class, subclass, and keyword. Okay. Uh, when you go to the Denver Public Library downtown or to the Denver Patent Office, is you can use the Patent Office software. Which is not online, it's an thread. So that way, you're using the software examiners, so that's the best. 
And all it really does is um, it gives you a lot of split screens, like you can look at multiple paths at once, and figure sets, and text, and it keeps a record of your search for you, so it's more efficient. But it's going to take some time to learn that system. So I usually tell inventors if you've got one or two inventions, it's probably more efficient to pay a searcher to do a search for you. But if you've got a half dozen or a dozen different ideas, then take the time to learn to do your own search. And then you can kind of filter it through and learn more about how you can find the most important ones of all years. Yeah, but I, the preliminary, you know, just online with Google Patent Office or uh, the European Patent Office is pretty good for a first cut. As uh, it's, you're going to have to spend hours, it's called the East and West system, the Patent Office, but you're going to have to spend probably about 10 hours playing with it to start to be good at it. And make it useful. And then you have the inconvenience of you've got to go to the library or the patent office to use it. It's not available. Yeah. Uh, um, you said you can go to any library? Yeah, only in the downtown. Because yeah. they have them in what they call the. Uh, there's a federal depository library, one, maybe two in each state. And so they fund that. So in the state of Colorado, it's just not a company. They like a big state, like California, they might have two or three of them. But like I say, the general online, quite a bit of And they do have a new feature now. Uh, and it's available generally online. It's called Air System, P-A-I-R. Patent application information retrieval. So, this is where you can get into the uh, electronic file cabinet at the patent office on public pending patents and issued patents. So, the beauty of this is if you find one patent pretty close, you can go into a spot and see the bachelor communications between the applicant and the patent. Also, get access to the example of search so that can help you understand what they're looking for with the classes. What is that website called? Hair? Hair? Yeah, if you go on the USPTO site, go to quick links and it'll show up. So, uh, the limitations on it, um, it was just started in 2001, so anything older than that would be there. And uh, if that's getting covered by the stuff. But if you have one older than that, uh, you'll have to pay someone probably one or two hundred bucks to go to the patent office, they dig up the paper file, and they come across and Xerox it and mail it to you. So that's the oldest way. <laughs> but if it's a really close case, it may be valuable too. And then the other catch on that is uh, applications are only public on here 18 months after the file. So, from their filing to 18 months, there's still a secret. So that's still kind of a black hole. So it could be useful. So uh, the patent itself, I mean, I'm not how familiar with the anatomy of it, but the rights are in the claims. It's like a piece of property. And uh, the claims. On an infringer, if it's like a, a reverse Boolean logic thing, it's like if my invention has component A, B, and C, and that's what my claim has to say about the proof. So if uh, an infringer's out there, a competitor, if they make a similar product that only uses element A and B, they're not infringed. If they add element A, B, and C, they are infringed. So if they have element A, B, and C, and then some can be in addition to that, they're infringing. So as long as they have a core of what you have, it's infringing. If they have less than what you have, it isn't. So this is why patents rise claim in a very minimal manner. manner. <laughs> uh, example, okay, let's pretend this isn't invented yet. I've got a cup. 
And uh, so I might have claim for this as a, as a base, and let's say it's got a side. And then let's say it, it defines two volumes. There's the outside volume and the inside volume. And that's all I say. I don't talk about size, I don't talk about shape, I don't talk about materials, I don't talk about the kind of handle. So I really got to minimize so that anybody that makes an enclosure with a volume and it can be shaped like a round or a little square, I can get a perfect And so that's why we plan to plan it. In. Or somebody can change the shape and change the materials. And you notice in the plane, I don't talk about physical structure, I don't talk about its use. You know, I don't say it's for a lot because that's limited. <coughs> How many uses are there for this, right? Millions of years now, we may be able to hurt the planter, I can't even shell game like it. So this is how we make it compatible. Is this pattern um, really isn't related to what you're making, it's a shield against competitors. And that's the way it's set up. So it's not an instruction to kind of make a product, it's to thwart competitor copy hands. So I have this patent broadly now. This particular version is styrofoam with an angle wall in this round thing. So that's a specific version of my broad base sign wall. That kind of gives you an idea of the way Aristotle's idea of the the world of ideas. There's a perfect chair. It's an idea of a chair. Everyone who makes a chair makes a copy. Right. <laughs> See, a chair is a good one. Um, if you're going to pack a chair, let's say it wasn't an image yet, I would claim one leg. That's all. That gives me the broadest coverage. That way, anybody that makes a chair one, two, three, four more legs, I've got to cover it. Does the chair work with one leg? Yes. Is it convenient? No. <laughs> but it is convenient. But it can work with one leg. So it's like this no handle, it's a little bit less convenient. That is possible. Right? So that's the way a pack kind of works. It's a minimally positive version. We use a building school so a few pieces of food and work together. Yeah. And it worked this way. Yeah. <laughs> there's, uh, so yeah, there's a lot of confusion on patents, but it's really a property, right? Think about real property, like this building, right? There's a legal description for this property, right? And it's, it makes this shape. It's in 2D, but it comes back to where it starts. It defines a boundary, right? So everything within the boundary gives the property. Everything outside of the boundary is the property. Okay, and when I have a legal property description, I don't say a word about what I do with the property. Right? I don't say it's got a lake on it. I don't say it's got tires on it. It's rock on it. I just put it on the boundary. And so that's in the patent world, that's what we're doing with a catch, we're defining a boundary with words, not talking about its use. That's a good issue. Anyway, and so patents are, they're bought and sold like real property. When we license a patent, we're like renting it, leasing it. We lease a patent for somebody who uses technology for a time and they pay the world to do that. So it's like leasing. Uh, or you can assign you can sell. Yeah, you can sell it. Um, so that's kind of like a patent property. Are there any questions? So you can have your own patent correct? Or it has to be some place. Well, they, um, there's two phases. It has a life of 20 years from the file date, and that's when you can go after infringers. At the end of 20 years, you can't go after infringers, but the patent is blocking prior art forever against anyone else patenting that. So you can never repatent the same thing. 
so we can, we can have patents from you know, the first one has say to 1790, that patent can still block the patents on the other towers. That was the first patent, 1790? In the U.S., yeah. So what was it? It was for a method of making soap. <laughs> Signed by George Washington. Because he, uh, he kept the pack files under his bed and she walked it. <laughs> That's before we had a patent office. We didn't have a patent office until like 1836. And then it became a separate function. But I think up until about the late 1800s, you had to submit a working model of your attention to the patent office. So in those days they were all in camp, and so if you let us over the table talk about this, it's a steam engine or something, they have to make, send the patent office. So it's a, there's a few around the guy who wants to keep the same. Mm-hmm. The table talk is like, so I'll let you go to the table. Yeah. Yeah, the table makes the space. Yeah, the table makes the space. Yes. So say if you find a product down there and it's out there already, but you can make it better. You can add stuff to it and make it better. What then so you can do a point, that's the continuations. Um, and there's no limit on the number of continuations, except that the immediate prior application has to be pending. So I can do continuations for the whole 20 year life of that. The catch is Let's say I file a continuation of year 10, its life is based on the first patent, so it just has a 10 year life. So that way you can't stretch the, the life of the patent. But you can get those changes in the continuations. And so that's a strategy people have. Well, I see the patent pending, so they have that window open and file the changes. Well, what if we're part of the Pakana project and I can make better? But I'm adding to it, there's nothing I can do because they have that in place and I can't put anything. Oh, someone else? Well, it depends if, if they got the idea from you. Well, so well, if, well, yeah. if they independently uh, developed it before you, then yeah. Well, if my idea is better or something that, that's out there already, that's what I'm saying. If they have an open patent on it. Then we just say that they make the same infringement and then they can come up with that idea that I just came up with. Yeah, it depends how close they are. Changes. They're pet 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 changes. They're yeah. So then, then, then what I mean? Because the theory is like, if you, if you snag things from the public domain and try to patent it, it's already existing. And so well, I know like there's been like the little weed or whatever, they made that evaporated now, and they, but there's different different ideas of the way they, the heads are now. I mean, they're changing, they're still getting patents, they're still increasing the, the quality of it, but. And what, what if they have a patent pending and they can still make these changes, but yet it's not been, been made yet by that company? I can go in and remake that product and still get a patent on oh, it. Uh, it doesn't matter if they made it or not, it's what the patent says. It's the patent says. Yeah. Like you, if you patent something, there's no legal requirement for you to make the product. You just have a patent. patents on all kinds of technologies. Just until someone buys it from you. Yeah. Because it's, it's just a shield right. against outsiders. Now, most people do want to make this in their patent. Um, you don't have to. You can make something a little bit different. Okay. And yeah, you, you see it that. It changes a little bit. Times you see it. You see the market and you realize that it actually changed your face. <laughs> with the patent shows, it'll be a bug. But still, he can, he can patent for the new component for something that you want to add to it. Right? Yes. That's a continuation. You can add. New well, it's like you can go either way. You make the product right and go that way. Also. It really, it's really driven on if the new feature has commercial value. If it has commercial value, that's what the revolution is. It's easier to say than to actually figure out. Right? 
the question is, would it be valuable to Yes. You said that most people will keep it at the day and that's what they put continuations on. Right. So then, what is a patented product? Why would someone just patent it? So um, you can have both. Like, I find out my first one, then I find a continuation on this thing. So they're both pending, and then the first one issues. This one's so okay, so okay, so then my second question is what is issued in the patent office? Did this all this research? They promoted it and then it. Yeah. Okay. But the pending one is still going to say to the BT. Right. So I still have this job. Maybe you're coming in there. See, it gets near a sheet and then I start another one. I'm just a day and two or a sheet. This is sheets and this is a sheet. And that, in the old days, I had to have some new restrictions. Like, I can come in for 20 years or something. To go back, and this is from the old days before 1995, the patent life was different. It was 17 years from this issue that the file date didn't matter. So, under those rules, people literally had a patent in 50, 60 years mm -hmm. to watch technologies in the market. And it was, it was kind of like creating a lot of fraud. So, now that the life of the patent is finished 20 years from the file date, so you, you can't go in any more than 20 years. Yeah. Uh, what do you feel is the, the most important thing, uh, kind of uh, things in invention once patent to succeed? Would it, would it be kind of like how creative it is or like the business built around it? Because I know a lot of people are focusing on the product, but like, or if they don't know exactly the business skills that are required to run a market and launch the yeah, there is there is a big difference between a product and a business. And the business stuff is more trade secret, like marketing plans, customer lists, financial data, business strategies, all that stuff. <laughs> so that's secret. <laughs> And you know, that's critical success, but it's kind of the hardest part. Sometimes people will pack the business method. They're trying to sell it in like a way of doing something. They're kind of difficult to patent. So you can patent like, like the process of like doing business stuff. Like a so certain kind of function. Like, like the process of doing, you know, running your yeah. business. Yeah, if you have like a. a like, if you think about. Uh, think of a, a product of gadget three ways. We have the physical structure of it, and the components. Then we have a method of making, a method of manufacturing, the process steps. If there's something you need there, that can be patented also. And then there's a next method, or another method, the method of using it. Like how the user goes through steps. So sometimes that's the part of it. Sometimes an invention, just the method of making your use is just patentable, not the product itself. Like I had a, a dental tool made out of sapphire, which is, you know, like synthetic glass. It's very strong. So using for a dental tool to uh, uh, pack cavities, pack the uh, composite in the, the cavity tube, and then you sign it shining off the light, the key, ultraviolet light into the Sapphire and it cures the positive too. So um, the shining of the light in the magnet composite is known. And um, the use of sapphire and mineral tools is known. But our process of hanging and curing the, the cavity was in. So we got the patent on the process of using the not the structure of the tool. So that's the case of sometimes that offsets like that. But it is so did you find the tool? So because the uh, the tool is unique, we sell the tool, but the protection is on the process. But you can't you can't do the process without the tool. So um you could go from designing a speed to the product. And the method. Yeah, and the 
change the momentum of the product is not only one people to be organized, it's just a new Then, then they So that might be done. Let's say I have a new way of making three years. Now, the chip I'm making is no one code. The chip is going to But I have a new way of making it. Let's say it's fast. That process is fast. <laughs> so that's that's the way we can get to parse it out and, and get that coverage. Sometimes those, those process of use give you broader coverage than the structure. So think of the process as a step by step. And if I got at least one unique step, it's not the one in the public that when you said you keep your claims really simple and minimal, but they ask for background and history and uses. Yeah, that's another part of the application. So uh, that, you know, you can put in as much as you want, but the claims are just the claim that it's minimized. Like I could, I claim this is just two lines, the base and the surrounding sidewall, but in the body of the pattern, I can talk about a thousand different ways in which it You know, but that doesn't count against it. Do they, do they take all that other stuff into consideration? Well, they're, they're concerned if they don't really care about too much. <laughs> So, the men up there, I have to describe what I'm doing. And if I add to that, it would feel. Um, sometimes that's beneficial to you because if I want to revise something later and add something, I have to have it already discussed in the body of the application. So, um, the, the rule of thumb is plain short. By the application of all Because uh, when you make amendments to the claims, you have to pull out of that part. You can't add anything. So unless you file a new application. Now, we, if you make a thing of the basic utility, the cheapest version, you get three claims. Uh, is that right? You get three claims for the price of the thing. You get 20, but there's a mix. There's three independents and 17 dependents. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a good saver with not You can say I can do three versions, three independents. Or I can do um, structure, method of making, method of using. Those three things. You can add claims to the separate <coughs> There's no limit. You can put it in the place where you want. But they charge. You can try it. Mm -hmm. So the economics of it, it charges a lot for claim. Mm -hmm. Like 100 bucks. Mm -hmm. But they don't be discouraged yeah. to do to, to new claims. So if you're a minimum of 20 claims. Yeah, if you're a blind girl entity, which is the cheapest, like the five individual, your file will be 100 bucks. Then you do 20 claims. But if I add one more claim, it's another hundred and five dollars. So, you know, I would double the file fee to add four claims on the claim, so it's not very good. Better for me to file two patents. So it's eight hundred dollars to get forty points. <laughs> so that's in the other case, I have for eight hundred dollars, I get twenty-four claims. That's not a good deal. But each claim is supposed to be a very minimal state. <laughs> right, and then they, they can you can string them in the daisy chain so they add to each other. That's the like, the tricky part of this. When we daisy chain, we're adding detail features. Okay, and so you go, well, what details do I add? But for this, what are my details? Well, it could be the shape, the size, the material, the handle, all this stuff. So the way you're supposed to pick which details to add is the details can be in the thousands, right? 
So the details you pick are the ones that I think the competitors want or would be valuable in the market. So, you know, the color of it would be a, a detail I worry about. But maybe the materials would be a detail I worry about. Let's say the cheap manufacturers. So you've got to always kind of be thinking about play devil's advocate, like you want to steal your own product, try to figure out if I want to knock this off, what do I want to get that set to cover? It's not, it's easy to talk about hard to answer in the real world. Yeah, you say keep it minimal but make it a lot. So I can say that in the details, the, the points are um, like I'm going hunting and I have, you know, a bow and arrow, a shotgun, and a rifle. So if I have all these different scopes of what I can catch with, that's what the planes are. Some are broad, some are narrow. So I have all this different ammunition, and I'll throw the infringer the one that fits the best. So the, the best case is a narrow plane that's dead on. If I have a really broad plane that's kind of close to it, then we because they can argue with this one. So I in 2000, I had uh, two ideas to bring uh, two, two of my ideas to bring bring company, uh, and uh, they said send the details, and I sent the details item by item, and they said, "Well, this is interesting, and uh, that's forwarded to our headquarters, and they will give you." They never did it after that. They, they, we did just a few times back and forth, and then after that, they stopped it. And then later on, like a few years later, one of them was the um, airplane with parachute, when something happened to the airplane. So airplane can land with parachute. And I designed that, and I combined that with detaching the different parts of the airplane when the airplane that um, something happened to the engine. So you can uh, detach the part and land the, the cabin of the uh, passenger safely with parachute. Yeah. And that's recently actually done. Uh, I don't have all the email because I, I changed my email. I don't have that old email. I printed out just part of that, like at the beginning when I was doing back and forth. Is there any way to go after them? Because basically after... Did you, did you have them sign a contract? No, no contract. It was just email back. At that time, I didn't know anything about that. See, they'll, they'll just say that it was about to be disclosed. Because actually, email is not confidential. You know, email goes out of a bunch of servers and you can look at it. They can argue that's a public disclosure, so you See but they replied to it. Um, they replied. They said, "Send the uh, the details." And then I sent all the items. Right. Like it was hundred. So what thing you can get them on if they say file a patent on it? And then actually, they're going to list some inventors. Mm -hmm. So you go to the patent office and say, "Hey, I'm the joint inventor on this." <laughs> so they come in front of the patent office and then you can force them. To add you to the patent, and then we're going to be able to get a lot out, or kill the patent. You know, the patent because they didn't draw the patent on. So, when you file a patent, all the inventors sign an affidavit that says, I'm the inventor. <laughs> and if you're not, you're not the inventor, then we can attack the patent. But that's, that's the whole thing. Uh, as a rule of thumb, you should never submit like your set of money. Yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know okay. that. Um, the best thing to do is get a quick provisional and get yourself covered and then send it. Mm -hmm. Or make them sign up confidentiality beforehand. Um, the trouble is they'll resist that sometimes. So, uh, so the safest is you get a provisional. 
a lot of people try to go that route. It's usually not successful because companies, you know, get outsiders all the time. Yeah. So the best thing you can do besides getting that thing is main contacts, network, get to know people at higher levels in the organization so you can get some attention at the right level. Sometimes it works. <laughs> but you know, if it's tricky, some things aren't kind of right. Some might say, well, I have an idea for a TV show. So I'm going to go to Universal Studios, you know, and uh, I, you can't kind of take it. I don't know, maybe we can copyright it or something. And that kind of deal, you have to get a confidentiality. Sometimes that works for people. They get some money, but it's it's tricky. It's, you know, they they're used to being approached all the time. You know, like you know, these labels of the same stuff, they'll be turning that over. You know, this policy, they don't have access to it, so they have to sue them for people. It's kind of screwy because it doesn't it interferes with the old exchange of ideas. But big companies, you know, they just they get so many outsiders, they just still uh, be able to know. The companies are all different. Some companies are open to outsiders. You know, there's no non constant rule. You know, they just, if you have an idea, even if it's protected or digital, and you approach someone and they either go forward or talk about it, that's the norm, but it's right. You can just say it's your boss on the system. <laughs> You can take advantage of it. Yeah. How much money did you make from your invention? What's that? How much money did you make from your invention? How much money did you make from your invention? Oh, actually, the ones I named on I was a corporate employee, so I didn't know. I've had some clients. A few clients do well. You know, the commercialization bit is, uh, is tricky. I mean, the guy coming in like here for uh one of his dimensions, I think he sold out to his major customer for about 300000 So that, that was one of his good ones. And then he had another dimension, he spent 50000 on it and ended up dropping. <laughs> What do you think makes an invention good? Uh, in the business end of it, right? That's the hard part. That's the, uh, the patent sitting alone without the product being successful. You know, it's, it's a shield, like a helmet, right? The helmet's sitting on the shelf, it's not much value. It's on your head while you're you know, speeding down the mountain at 60 miles an hour instead of what the hell. So it's, it's always associated with how well the business does with the product. How much uh, capital do you think it would take to, to launch it? Not, not to manufacture and make the product, but uh, for the prototype, but as far as like packing and all the things like this. Like a general kind of budget that you should keep in mind. There's, there's a good book that's got a lot of examples of that called Magic Nation. You get on Amazon, I think it's by Steve Reader. He's got like about 100 cases of like different products, so much you can spend for launching your leaf. And most people spend anywhere from probably 20 to 300,000 in on the nature of the product. To, to get it going. I mean, like, having a trade marketing, you know, it's maybe 10% of your budget. It's just your start. But the major amount of money is getting your manufacturing set up, uh, getting your inventory build up, uh, sales and promotion, all that stuff. It's packaging. Gosh, you know, I have a lot of clients that have smaller products, they have more money in the package than the products. Packages, you know, it's the attention. Some people just want that, but that can happen. So, is there tra trademarks? Uh, so, I just got uh, trademarks on a product, and I don't know the name. 
Don't point you guys at TM. Oh, if you get a TM all the time, there's no restriction. Uh, there's just a restriction on the R and the surface. You have to be registered with the federal certificate. So after I get my trademark, I can put the little R after the trademark? Yeah, then you can put the R. But um, if, if you say have a bunch of things printed or made up, it's still a TM, you can still use it. So it's in, you can still use the stuff that has TM even after you're approved. <coughs> it's okay. Yeah, so I, I just got a person that hasn't done the packaging, so I just put it in. Yeah, so then you put the R. What's the R saying? It's registered. registered. So TM is just saying I'm claiming a trademark right that I'm not registered. So it should be TM and R? I'm just R. I'm just an R in a circle. Okay, that's after TM? Uh, is that after TM? After trademark? Oh, it's in lieu of replace that. Replace it. Oh, replace the TM? Yeah, so you get the R and take the TM off. Oh. Yeah. 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 Uh, you have the TM, uh, it's nationwide. If you're getting notice of a trademark right usage, uh, so you have a state trademark, but it really it doesn't really have any rights to you, but a federal does. So, <clears throat> the beauty about federal is, I mean, uh, State, you have to show business in the state. So I'm only getting coverage where I sell products. So the federal gives you a point of view of the states. But if you're just marketing your product within the state of Colorado, can't you get a TM and then that's protecting the trade name or trademark is protecting the state? Yeah, you can't register the state. I mean, yeah. for, it's cheap. But you should go for a federal because it's much more Although the federal requires you to sell interstate because it's a national right. It's a lot stronger. And most people would have thought if they were going to sell interstate. Um, so that's usually not And the other thing is to do the federal union before you're making and selling the product, you can reserve the name ahead of time. For up to 36 months. So that's kind of nice. I can I can know I've got a name reserved before I can talk about the triggers stand it on the bottom. Um, so that's that's the you know. deal. And you keep in mind trademark, most of us say it's a name, but what do you mean? You know, logos, designs, colors, artistic characters, sounds, smells. As long as it's uh, something else is used. So, so what smell is trademark? Huh? What smell is trademark? Oh, like a few companies just again. But it's, uh, you think of the, uh, Broadness of recognition, like a word, like my ear or something. It makes a visual impression, sound impression, and a meaning impression. So if I have a smell, I lose visual and I lose meaning. In other words, it just activates one sense, where a sound one activates one sense. So uh, word, a word is the broadest protection. Although you can use slogans, two, three, four words. But you know, you want something people remember. It's easy to spell. You can go online, Google, and you can find That sort of thing. It's hard to get out of the smell. But you know, it's all on, you know, the smell is very important. 
to the Father in for the sound of it. So, as soon as I registered for trademark, I start getting letters from some companies for Facebook saying, oh yeah, that's all scams. Yeah, so it's like, it's like, they, they get that issue for a $2,900 to register for it. Yeah. As, as, if an attorney asks for you to do it, you list the correspondence contact with the trademark office. So they only send official notice to that one contact. So uh, anything, anything now you can tell a client like find the contact, they get it incorrectly and it's not official. Because what's bad about it is I put it in a letter that looks official, let's we'll say it's from Washington DC, it's great line of Senate or something. People get all upset. <laughs> so you didn't tell me that I was going to go and say it's not a yeah. But um, they do it because it must work. It looks official. Yeah. Do you have an app in this very department that you can put that number on your device? Right, when you're, when you're issued, yeah. So you have to have a similar. That is the device you have to put a mark on. And you put the number on. You got to get notice. It's kind of What happens if you don't? Uh, What's the, the problem if you don't put the number? Well, if I'm an infringer, then I can claim you to give me notice. <laughs> so, all my infringement until you tell me about it, I mean, and I don't have to pay you what it is. <laughs> So, what it does is it gives the infringer a defense to say it didn't have a So, how about the software? <laughs> well, you, can, you put it on packaging, you put it on uh, your documentation, your instructions, you put it all over. So, you can say, look, you know, there's no notice here. Because I know sometimes, you know, uh, like when I made a chip, <laughs> Some products is not hard. Sometimes the product is yeah. so small. Yeah, yeah, but you put it everywhere. Yeah. 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 Advertise with it. Oh, cool. it. It helps in their product promotion and marketing because it makes it look more genuine. It's not that good. Yeah. Is there, is there a company out here in Ring that actually walks you through all this? And then you, then you would just recommend it to that. I'll just get started. I mean, if I, if I go in and do the research on my own, find if there's nothing out there I can get, or if there's some. Oh. Before I get back, is there a company that actually works with me through a lot of this and got costing me for it? The best is the uh, library. I don't know how to find a company that you can know, go to actually physically and, and then walk you through all this so well, I can do all my steps and do it right. The patent office has some pretty good instructions and videos. Mm -hmm. Nice. Go and ask them questions. Well, I'm going to do my own name and just do more and send your back. Is there anybody else that can actually? As long as my idea is a good idea and I can get this patented, after I get the patent, I'm going to move on and to get the best person to. Yeah, you're, unless you know somebody, you know, friends and family, uh, outside investors typically aren't going to be interested until so they've got a work product, having that action on some specificity, and maybe a winner in the market and show some success. And then people get interested. So you kind of have to get the ball rolling on your own. Find friends or you know, someone to partner up and say, uh, I'll give you, you know, percent of the profits or you know, what should be. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, yeah. It's, it's kind of a little ad hoc how people start. I mean, short tank is what I mean. You're just starting. Traditional investment is not going to be there, and a bank is not so low. So, but you can, you know, if you've you got a collateral like a house or a car with equity, you can borrow these other things. 
credit cards, you know, that's unsecured debt. You can get money that way. Uh, you know, there's ways, but it's kind of, it's tricky at first. And then once the business gets going, then it's easier. So I'm talking about the digital manufacturer, I can go, I've got the other, other ways to go to it. You got a rich uncle? Yes. Not at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's always, that's always a nice thing that. Yeah, I was. I've been in the workforce. I mean, <laughs> And I just know that I know the workforce area and I know what needs them. But I need the money and the other. Yeah, usually, I mean, partnering with the right people, I and mean, not only do you need money, but you need someone to put in. Well, I talked to an in investment, or uh, an invention investor. This is what it came up with. So he asked, um, I'm looking to get investors for my invention. So, they're just not out there, right? I mean, it's just well, not until I get everything going on. The, the sad reality is, I think for most startups, that the angel ventures fund about ten percent. And let's start going out. So they're they're, they're going to be digging because there's eyes and more money looking for money than people providing. Right. right. For that. Because you're in the ninety percent, doesn't mean your idea is bad. It just means you're going to have to go about it differently. And you know, sometimes getting those guys isn't the greatest because they want to take so much ownership from it. And they, they might uh, get a little too involved in running your company. <laughs> you know, sometimes people, what I mean, though, I mean, they, they want to stay in control of their thing. So they're going to limit outsiders. You know. Well, as long as you keep the 51% of the company, you're at home, right? And that, that's hard to do. Because you put money in. Like the last, the last angel deal I did, I mean, the angels take 100% of the profits for like the first five years. And so everyone else is just, they suddenly just turn into an employee until they hit this threshold of paying back like two thirds of the angels' money. And then they can start. It's, it's a tricky decision because you know just because you you got an angel that says okay doesn't mean you're an easy street necessarily. Well, I'm just gonna take a long because I had another deal where I guys started a company and had some angels got it on and then had some big time angels in the venture capital. And the venture capital people put in their own management and kicked out the founder. So it's like, your company's dead. So I, I call it the big C, it's a control issue, and that's kind of a personal thing. Find out who's going to sign the check on the front. Yeah. So when people put money in your company, you know. They're probably just not going to sit back and be patient. No, I'm going to that too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would want to all one participant. So it's, uh, you know, if it's the right people, I mean, if they've got connections and expertise, like they can offer you more than the money. Like they right. know certain people. That's what I know. Your company. That could be the good You know, that's the best deal. It's a Exactly. It's going to be. It depends on, on personalities and stuff. What the angel adventure is going to do, you get the capital so you can speed things up. So, is that going to be a real benefit to you as opposed to growing the store and like, you know, getting money from product sales or something? Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to say that uh, we're very fortunate in Denver to have a traditional patent office. Not, not very many cities do. And you can, oh, yeah. down, <laughs> you can go down there to the office, like I took a rough patent application, and a lady came out and she went through the whole thing, several things. You know, you can use this term, you know, that sent us down this road, and you better change that term because that's not what I mean. You know, she 
She can't probably serve minutes to go this room. Well, that's good. Yeah, I mean, that's that's part yeah. of their purpose. Yeah. You know? Otherwise, you'd have had to go to the DC to get that same house. Right. Yes. Yeah. We're very fortunate. They're, they're really nice. Uh, so, what's the office actually? 1961 snap. But it's uh, it's in a like an 18 story high rise, so they're just on uh, the 14th and 15th floor. Okay. They're just a sliver in there. But they've uh, and they they had a big push probably the last five six years to uh, be involved in the event community and helpful and open because it is more than it used to be. Um, so you know, take advantage. It's free out, but your tax dollars are good. <laughs> well, actually, they're self funded. I mean, you know, the filing fees pay for all the restoration. Well, they have examiners now that mm -hmm. I don't know, we have 30 or 40 that are actually working on patents all day long. He's yeah. from the office? Uh, no, no, no. no. <coughs> Any better? I have a question about uh, copywriting. Um, when, uh, like, a website or a product is copyrighted, should they uh, renew it every year, or if it is from the next version? I don't quite understand. Like, um, when uh, there is a website, they right. copyright it. Right. right. It's copyrighted. But should they renew it every year? Or it's just once until next version. If you change it, yeah. Only if you, if you change it? Yeah. Because a copyright is for a uh, fixed medium, right? And so if you change graphics or text, that's a new copy. Oh. Yeah. So copyright is just exactly what, what's out there. Yeah. Copyright protects the expression, but not the underlying idea of concept. Whereas patent protects the underlying idea of concept. But the expression can be in things. But that doesn't mean copyrights aren't valuable because some of them are very valuable. And not, again, the commercial success of what's copyrighted. And copyrights have a very long life. 75 or 95 years. So it's, it's complicated because it's based on the life of the author plus it's need to calculate each time. You know, keep it simple. Speaking of patents, right now you get, you get it okay. Everything goes through on a patent. What else do you suggest to get with that patent? We're talking about all these other things. Oh, well, um, definitely at least a trademark, because you got to call it certain words. That's what you're going by the market. Probably those are the two basics. You know, there's um, copyright, design, patent, trade dress. It, it depends on the type of product it is and what you're protecting it. So there's how many things you know, that's out there? That you it's like you, you would come to me and say, this is what my market knows me by this shape or this color, and I don't want a competitor, you know, copying that and confusing. Well, it's in your pattern or trademark? Both. Both, you yeah. know. Okay. Yeah, there's no problem with overlapping. Okay, so if you get pattern in one trademark, then after that, it should be fine? Or yeah, in a basic sense, yeah. Okay. And the, the, the one beauty about trademark is it never expires. You, every 10 years, you have to just show you're still in business. That's all. But it doesn't ever end until you quit using it. But your patent is still okay over here to keep it count. Keep it kind of, uh, two to to three, seven, and eleven years. All of the seven, eleven? Three, seven, and eleven. Keep it alive, yes. Okay, the value will expire. Right, right, right. right. Yes. Yes. Well, so every year you have. Not much bigger. Not yeah, but three to seven. Bigger. All right. Does it? Yeah. The thing is, the patent office, like when you file a four hundred dollar fee as a micro, they're losing money. 
because they're doing a search of two opinions and an office actions. The cost on that's probably twenty-five, thirty-five hundred. So they make that up with the original fees. The so how much is this going to be? Well, they ratchet up. But roughly they go, um, so it's 500, 1500, or 3000. Well, 3700. So they start cheap, but then they get more. And then you don't have to pay them. But if you don't, it expires more as well. So, you know, gosh, if you get a hot piece of uh, electronics technology by year seven, it may be obsolete. So you don't have to pay. Right. And statistically, about 50% get paid. 50% profit. You know, if somebody has to use the purchase of that, you catch up, it's 30 times the price. If it's a trademark, what happens? Like, if you catch somebody who used to trademark, like uh, trademark. Well, you have to look at the, the associated goods <laughs> and how close they're using it. So they have to be in the to pay for the same type of goods. And then basically, it, it depends what you want to do. You may want to make them license and pay for it. You may just want them to stop. You know, it's different for every situation depending on, on how they do it. How strong the case is, how close they are. But, you know, trademarks coverage is actually pretty broad. It's, we're looking at um, themes, probably a sight, sound, and meaning movie. So an example would be, I have a Red Bull, Woodmark, or energy drinks. So a company comes along and says, I'm going to call myself Blue Box, <laughs> trademark energy drinks. That's direct infringement, because it's the same theme. If you haven't changed the words, it's still a color and a specific type brand. Purple cow. So, you trademark blue ox or a red bull. Nobody can come and like tweak a few little things to get away with it. You know, and in other words, if they're confusing the public that they're like affiliated with you or not. But, they have to be in a, you know, the same product category, like your product and their product are side by side on the shelf. Mm -hmm. If it's a completely different product, there's nothing you can do. That, that and unless you're famous, <laughs> the being famous is hard to do, but like um, BMW famous. So I can't. Um, that they, they got cars that if I came up with a food product I called BMW, they could stop. It's a completely different product because they're famous. So you can have a superpower. <laughs> and uh, to be famous, it just it means that the name has to be known outside of its niche. Also, outside of its niche. So uh, someone who it's doing something unrelated to cars, so you know what BMW is over there. So, things. Because <laughs> a lot of trademarks are just knowing that they're the nature of the product here. They're not going to be outside of it. And it has to be nationwide. Because uh, there was a case with uh, Quest Communications here, which is the, the several names ago, phone period. They were claiming famousness. They got shot down. Even though they're known outside the niche, they were known nationally. They were only known regionally, so they were famous. No. So you got to be pretty darn famous. So, but normally you can block people in your product niche through your company. It, like the, the energy drink thing, let's say it was just a miscellaneous soft drink, and that's still good. You know, it's a bad niche. It doesn't have to be exactly the same like the related, related product. Yeah. Uh, do you know, or have you seen any cases where uh, you kind of, I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is like, how does one like kind of get, get uh, famous and get out of their, get known out of their niche? Do you know of any procedure? The way, the way they ought to do it 
is now uh, like they get involved with the case so they'll show that we spent millions on advertising this all over the country, all over the world. Uh, the other way they do it is when, when you file trademarks, you file under the specific good or service, but you can add goods or services to that. So if you look at something like Nintendo, you can see they filed for a copy maker. So <laughs> they add all these goods and services outside the niche because they're trying to get famous. To get like a superpower so that anybody that uses a word that sounds or looks like Nintendo, they can stop it. Is it a separate fee for each? Yeah. So that's how a trademark can get more expensive and practical. Because you'll see sometimes in the search reports they'll file 50 different products. <clears throat> and that's a difference, an added file fee for every product. Like 300 per product, so it adds up in the <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know that girl on Shark Tank where she like specializes in patents and things like that? Her name is like Sarah, something to do with bonding. Well, she has, I, I believe she has a company that, that basically you bring their, their idea to her and kind of have the, the process. Like the, the prototype already done, but she kind of takes it, I guess. Like, how does that work? Where, where she, like, does she co sign the patent and, like, get a process? Not co sign, but, like, does she, like, help you through the process and get a profit from it? Uh, well, it, it could be anything you want. I mean, that's definitely that some sort of license agreement. It could be some sort of business partnership agreement. So you can kind of, like, co sign the patent, I guess, if you with like yeah. a bigger company that specializes in that. Yep. You can uh, you can sell it, you can sell a part of it, you can license it. Um, I usually tell people though you should hang on to it as long as you can because if you sell out early then they make a lot of money on it. So Yeah, it was <laughs> You know, you don't want to sell it for five thousand Never sell, always license. Because so if you sell and that company goes bankrupt, you've lost your. You right, because it'll go to the, uh, the trustee. Bankruptcy trustee. But if you license, it can come back to you. Yeah, that happened to my president. We got a patent and uh, assigned it to a business, sold it to a business, and that business went bankrupt. So we ended up just nothing. So you're supposed to get some of the profits, but they went under. And, um, you know, if the, if the patent is associated with a successful product, it just happens. And then, of course, it's aging. You know, if it's only about five years old, it's not worth the time. And then technology is starting to get out of it. You know, it, it depends on the fact that you have some products that technology has to be aging. Like a mechanical tool or something. You get one from. But, you know, something on a smartphone. Any other questions? Copyrights, trade dress, scams. Why do people call the scams? Oh, scams. <laughs> yeah. Um, if these companies. Say, you know, give us your idea and we'll take care of everything. <laughs> you just can't say anything. <laughs> like I tell people, you, you have to stay like a general contractor. Like, you may contract out design, and manufacturing, and marketing. And but stay in control, stay in touch, and in charge of it. Because if those companies, like one of them is called Van Helden, uh, they take in thousands. People's products, and then they just don't give them the vigilance attention. Vigilance is another one. Yeah. I checked with that. 
We want to say, well, well, we'll take your, your product to a trade show. That means there's a the trade show, there's a table, and there's this big book. No one's paying attention. <laughs> but they, they get a lot of people because yeah. the whole thing is people have an idea and go, I don't want to start a business. I don't want to mess with it. I don't want to be an entrepreneur. I just want someone to take the idea and run with the thing. But that's very difficult. Seeing chances. But then they fall into those guys and their success rates and products are really low. So I, I just tell people if you have an idea, you really gotta be an entrepreneur. Sure, part of my At least at first. <laughs> Part of the part of the building something that he gives fifty one percent of the company. He didn't hardly do nothing, but yet he still owned the company. Uh -huh. And he wasn't really a participant in the company. The company made millions. He still, in the end, he ended up buying them out forty nine percent or whatever out. Then he owned his own company and then he sold it out. But during that whole time, they were the other ones that built the company, the other ones that did everything for the company. We had just still one percent. So he was in control yeah. for He was like luckier than us. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's like that's the ideal scenario. It really is. Um, yeah. Typically a clarification of patent claims keep it simple. Would you use terminology, for example, Che? You would say in your claim I don't know if you say the word chair, but a chair consisting of at least one leg, one back, one base, which give you broad protection, or would you just say no legs? No, I, I would. I wouldn't say leg. Like, I would probably say something like extension element. Okay. <laughs> because uh, what if it went like this? Right. Right. Instead of like right. this. Right. So if I you use very uh, generic terms. Okay. Now, I wouldn't say a seat, I would probably say a support. Okay. Because uh, the seat implies a flat plane. Mm -hmm. And a support be is just anything that holds you. It's going to be like a chunk of a bicycle saddle on a pole. Okay. Um, so when I started this business, they say when you write claims on a product, put the product in outer space. And then you write claims on uh, features relative to themselves. <laughs> and that, that helps you think broader because there's there's no up or down, there's no left or right. <laughs> it's just the product all by itself. And that if you write the product relative to itself, it's to be broader. So break free of the That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's like when you when you first read a patent, it's like, oh, this is the worst legal use, and then all of a sudden it makes sense to crazy. <laughs> but your eyes thinking, you know, like the, the whole point is you don't want someone to, to make a small change right. and get away with it. But you want them to force them to make a big change to get away with it. As much as that happens a big change. Yeah. Uh, Say you're someone like me who just a whole bunch of arguments. Like, did you just try to mod as much as stays? Or like, the best thing is to learn to search you so you can go through and like focus and narrow down to your best potentials. Because you know, two things you want to know that you can possibly get a patent so you don't find anything close to it, and then you want to assess uh, its commercial potential. If you're good on those two things, then you should do something. Commercial potential is a lot harder because it's more amorphous. Because you know, you can I say, well, this, I didn't find anything like it in the patent, so why isn't this product out there? Well, maybe it's because no one wants it. <laughs> maybe no one pushed it. Who knows? Probably the most important thing is. What's it going to take to market? Yeah, because some things are easier to make than others. A million dollars to market it. Yeah. Uh, that is worthless, unless you've got a million dollars. 
There's a new things you can use social media as a great way to get the word out without upfront capital, but it's, it takes a lot of time. That, um, like when, as I was saying, next month, I mean, the successful product he builds is because it was a niche product. It was better able to get the biggest market with less money, as opposed to a general consumer product. You can't scoop your competitors out of it. You may not have direct competitors because you have people who kind of close products. And are you going to be able to get in that market or are they going to attack you right away? <laughs> There was an article that I read uh, in the Denver Post about some gentleman outside of Boulder and Nightwalk. He was like, I had all these, all these ideas, and I told myself, well, which one would be the easiest that I could create, make money, and sell it so I could start the real business that I wanted to do that I could have a million dollars. I needed that million dollars. So don't take ownership of the business. Build it up to where it's almost going to get overtaken or something. You sell it, move on to the next one. And he said, he had Sold three businesses by the time it was 35, made 30 million dollars. He said, Now I'm doing what I want. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'll take 30 million dollars. Right. right, yeah, and that's just that's what we did. Bill made who wants it. Take the combat to exit. I mean, it's, it's great if you can sell to a corporation. Um, but, you know, they have to want you. Right. So you have to make yourself attractive to them. Right. Especially if it's a strategic buy as opposed to a financial. Mm -hmm. And most people that have the product success, it's probably the third, fourth, fifth, sixth time. You know, very few people like you do it once and get it. Right? It's kind of like this. So you just need persistence. Okay, you learn each time. Like if you go through it a few times, you get the game. You can do better. What was the uh, strategy on for the sell uh, patents before they come to the pumps? You said it was called, what was it called, exit? Or just just, 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 just traditional? No, 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 the, the, the strategy where you sell it okay. and over and over to, to start the business that you wanted to sell it was the name of the business. Well, they're, they're buying uh, the business. But that's a tax, a piece of that, that they're buying. Yeah. Is that like a strategy that people like studying and kind of use? Is it just something that I like have to study? There, there's business brokers. I mean, sometimes companies, they put themselves up for sale, they want to find someone to buy that. Other times they get approached. We, we had uh, a presentation on this very topic. I think I saw that the last time. Is on our site. Um, but if you want, I mean, I can send you the information from this presentation. So it's like, buying and selling businesses is kind of like real estate, but there's some different tools <laughs> and, and things to watch for. What was the thing? Um, Kevin Petty, CPM1. He's, that's all he does. He acts like the, uh, the legal counsel for people like this. Uh, but yeah, if you can sell it for a corporation, that's it. <laughs> and that's kind of the ultimate goal of everything. You can probably not keep your business forever. I mean, if you, you know, those, you know, you retire those retailers, they're probably not going to manage it as well. So, you know, somewhere along the line, it's kind of good. If it's a, a good product, it's probably going to be fun, and it's inevitable. Right. For the few years. Thank you for this, Mike. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. All right, that makes it. <laughs> I'm just trying to thank you. I appreciate it. You a lot <laughs> So, uh, please, all come back in two weeks. We got to take jabs. You can uh, talk to someone who's made a big. Thank you so much. Uh,
Thank <laughs> you.